to our slam. And next two weeks, you can be preparing for the April 9th, Friday, again at 7 o'clock slam. But first, I want to read the rules of slam from the Bible of Poetry Slam, <laughs> Hewitt's Guide to Poetry Slam and Slam Poetry, an excellent resource which no home library should be without. The poet shall perform original work only, without props, costumes, or musical accompaniment within three minutes, but with a 10 second grace period, tonight in front of five, three distinguished judges who will score the work in a scoring range of zero to 10 with decimal point to one place. Throughout the event, slammers will remember the points are not the point. The point is the poetry. Are we clear on that? Judges, raise your right hands, please, and repeat after me. I. 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 I Fill in your name. Julia Hewitt. Got Norman Rosenthal. Andy, did you say fill in your name? Andy Green. <laughs> Do hereby affirm. Do hereby, Do hereby affirm. affirm. That I shall remain objective throughout the slam. That I shall remain, I shall objective, remain objective, objective throughout, throughout the slam. Shall remain objective throughout the slam. Not giving unnecessarily high scores. Not giving, not giving unnecessarily, unnecessarily high, high scores. scores to my sweethearts, for my sweethearts, or those who I wish would become my sweethearts, or those who I wish would become my sweethearts. Nor giving nasty and low scores, nor giving nasty and low scores to those for whom I hold disdain. <laughs> those for, for those whom, for whom I, I hold disdain. disdain. I further understand. I further understand that my job, that my job is to score in the range of zero to ten. Is to score, is to score in the range, in the range of zero, zero to, 10, to ten. With one decimal point. With one decimal, one decimal, decimal point, point. A zero point zero, meaning don't quit your day job. A zero point zero, meaning don't quit your day job. All the way up to a 10, which means your poem and your performance blew my socks all the way to Toledo. All the way up to a perfect 10 that says that your poem and your performance blew my socks all the way to Toledo. Let's give it up for our judges. And now their qualifications, how it is they became judges. Scott Norman Rosenthal said, I'm qualified because I'm bizarrely neurodiverse and I wasn't allowed to complete ninth grade. Nevertheless, I studied poetical composition in college by invitation of Professor Stephen Dunn, who was subsequently awarded the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry. Let's hear it for Steve, for Scott. And all I can say is, Scott, it sounds like a cause and effect situation. And so I'm hoping you'll become my student, and therefore I shall then win a Pulitzer Prize. <laughs> Next is Julia Hewitt. Nice last name, but no relation, just a friend. 
Her qualification, she says, is with a name like Hewitt, how can I be anything but qualified? Let's hear it for Julia. <laughs> and finally, Andy Green. I'm qualified because I know a lot of poets. Some of my friends are even poets. I might name my next dog Poetry. Andy Green. Now, folks, these judges need an opportunity to set their standards. And I hope they understand that the score they give to sacrificial poets are their baseline. And they set their standard by how they score the sacrificial poets. It's so hard to find someone who's willing to offer themselves up to sacrifice the opportunity to be declared the winner of the slam, to not be part of the competition, just to give the judges some experience. And tonight, two people have volunteered to fill this extraordinarily important responsibility. One of them is our dear friend, Sabine Miller. Let's hear it for her. And the other, sacrificial, is yours truly, Jeff Hewitt. <laughs> and now, in three minutes or less time, judges, are you ready? I'm going to sacrifice. So I was coming around the corner, and the car ahead of me has stopped, and I'm on sheer ice. And my car starts to skid. And there's this guy on the sidewalk with a shovel. And just before my car crunches into the car ahead of me, he throws a shovel full of sand under my rear tires, and my car comes to a stop 10 feet from disaster. Half an hour later, I'm at the Xerox machine with the job I've got to have copied in time for the mail, which leaves in 10 minutes, and the machine jams, and I'm trying to get the paper out, and something throws a spark, so smoke is starting to curl from the ink drum, and I'm trying to figure whether I should run to the men's room for a handful of water when... This guy appears with a shovel, throws a shovel full of sand into the machine's underbelly, and the smoking stops. It's customary to applaud the poem when it's over. Usually a little louder than that. And now the judges are writing down the scores. And I'm going to count them down to three. Mute that dog. <laughs> or was that a slammer? <laughs> and on the count of three, judges, you're going to hold your scores up so we can all see them. Three, two, one. Show me the money. I got an 8.2, a 7.4, and a 5.0. I got a 6, a 20.6. Not bad. We usually applaud the score when I announce it also. <clears throat> Our second sacrificial poet. Please welcome to the stage the unmuted, unmuted, 
Sabine. <laughs> Give it up for Sabine. Okay. The power of story. Their stories lull me to sleep, filling my head with endless adventure. Their words stable me when I'm scared. These books are like sun and moon to me, filling my head with endless adventure. Characters flow in and out like the tide. These books are like sun and moon to me. I gasp and cry and smile and laugh. Characters flow in and out like the tide. When I read, my worries fly away. I gasp and cry and smile and laugh. And after time, the characters become real to me. When I read, my worries fly away. Their words stable me when I'm scared. And after time, the characters become real to me. There forms a place in my heart for all their adventures. Oh. Judges, on the count of three, Got a heart. one, two, three, show me the money. Oh, I've got a 9.3, a 9.4, and a 7.5, two carry the 119, a 26.2 for Sabine. Oh, God. Oh, I don't know what to say. Sabine, did you know that I'm the Poetry Slam champion of the state of Vermont? <laughs> did you know that? No. <laughs> well, it's true. And uh, I've just been beaten. How old are you? Are you 10 years old? Yeah. And you beat, you beat the Vermont Slam champion? <laughs> I guess. The author of the author of this book that I happen to own. Congratulations. It's, this is not a sanctioned championship slam, but in my power, I am going to declare you Vermont's Poetry Slam champion for March 26th and for a bonus day, March 27th, all day tomorrow, <laughs> you shall be champion. Congratulations. Well, moving on. Same screen. This time, the incredible Lisa. Please welcome her, our first official competitor of the day. <clears throat> Thank you, everybody. This poem is brand new for you, and it is called Spring Scrawls. Thin ribbed clouds across the sky, and I am undone by morning frost, heaving a pause to my pace. Road turned to muddy waves, a place to pause and pace myself because spring scrawl is slow, unfolding in cold mornings and warm afternoons cut by frigid wind, winter traces left behind by the spring of what's receding. The wellspring bubbles up from the cow pasture because earth can hold water no more and must overflow in a muddy oracle, spring speaking in woody creeks and rushing brooks, whispers just loud enough for deer to hear tender buds trembling on greening branches. First truth, bones and breath that somehow carried me past winter's edge, I am here now to greet you. Torn as I am by the winds of change, I know you will make me whole again. When I turn to the sky and see spring tracing clouds in thin scrawl along pink lines of morning that rise like misty ink over a horizon uncertain as the one that came before, first truth, 
I know you will make me whole again. And if the deer should fail to come and nibble trembling branches this year, I will ask spring to turn the clock back to a time before we had torn ourselves from the earth, re weeping for what I knew would mean our demise, even though it seemed uncertain as I hung on dawn's promise to follow the darkness my eyes springing tears from the dark well of promises broken by my own hands, my good intentions forged in spring's forgiving mud that takes every day as a matter of course, remembers me to wholeness because earth cannot forget what sky forged in the beginning. First truth, bones and breath, limbs and wind uprising, I walk your edge necessary ephemeral letting you go the more you come yes nice <laughs> job <laughs> judges on the count of three one two three let me see them i've got a nine point two an eight point two it's and uh scott you'll have to hold it a little closer and a 6.5 that's really good a 23.9 for lisa <laughs> please welcome to the stage none other than lee New to me driveway. Oops. <laughs> New to me driveway. An uphill driveway curving through a gate added by flatter landers than I, attached to no fence but guarded by leaf filled ditches, pines, and glacial boulders. Winter packed snow on the sloped shelf of dirt and gravel. Sunny days, light slid through bare pin cherry branches arched arms of needled pines, warming the right angle turn at the top, melting the curve. Afternoon rechilled it. I pushed the pedal against gravity, leaning forward, willing us upward to make the turn. Ice always found the tires there. I slithered, slipping back, momentum lost, backed uneasily down, trying to aim between the goalposts of the old gate, then thumping and scraping, back end sliding, back from the bend, leaf free scap sapling, scratching the bumper, finally the axle on the slip and slide of the backward drive. After a winter or two and their tow trucks, I learned the give and take of snow and ice, less pride, more ease. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, you know, your clapping can be heard if you clap longest or if you clap loudest. And don't be shy. Try to be heard. We know only one person at a time. So it's either the loudest and or the last to be making noise. Judges, on a count of three. One, two, three, hold them up. All right, Scott, a little bit over to the, uh, to, yes, good, a 7.5, an 8.5, and an 8.0, carry the zero one, a 24. Point zero for Lee. Yes. Moving right along. And folks, public service announcement. Don't forget two weeks from today, Friday night, the 9th of April, eight days after April Fool's Day, if that helps you remember, our second slam in honor of Poetry Month. And now, in honor of us all, please give it up 
for the unmuted J.D. Yeah. <laughs> this, um, this is a short one. It's called um, the dumpster. It's called the dumpster. Oh, louder! Oh, can you hear me? Okay. That's better. Oh, um, this is called the dumpster. The funeral was easy. The rules laid out. The way we bury things. Casket bought, obituary written, family and friends invited, coffin dropped, eulogy given, dirt covered death. The afterward was hard, fragments lost and found, the way of things we carry, shelves half emptied, squabbles unresolved, memories boxed and unboxed. One of many cookie jars tossed in the dumpster outside the house, like a leftover bubble no one wants to take. Yeah. Yes. Judges, on the count of three, I'm going to count backwards this time just to add a little bit of mystery. Three, two, one. Let me see them. I have an 8.0, a 7.8, and a 9.2. Zero, carry the 1, 16, a 25.0 for JD. And he moves into the lead. How, however, I have to point out he still hasn't topped the score of our amazing sacrificial poet. <laughs> but a 20, 25.0 for JD. Wait no longer. It's Hannah. Okay. This is called The House on Palmer Avenue. I could always feel the house breathing breath of contentment, cradling, hot summer feet and cool Cuban tile, exhaling into an embrace. Breath of contentment, cradling, the lull of voices on screen porches, exhaling into an embrace. Fern and oak, wisteria, azalea, the lull of voices on screen porches, the vibration of his song. Fern and oak, wisteria, azalea, cicadas and their night music. The vibration of his song, the scratch in her throat, cicadas and their night music. I could always feel the house breathing. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Judges, are you ready? Three, two, one, show me. I got an 8.0. Hey, Slowpoke, an 8.5 and an 8.6. A 25.1 for Hannah, and she moves into the lead. Oh, the mystery of it all. Please, welcome to the stage. Mark. He was called a <laughs> he was called a boat driver. Growing up on Cape Cod, he spent summers puddle ducking on Buzzards Bay. Sunburned, freckled, and windblown, he sailed his boat to and fro, tacking, running wing on wing, with an occasional jibe as the boom swung wildly amidships. He would lay on the dock watching horseshoe crabs as they danced in the shallows. Some nights he watched waves of phosphorescent jellyfish pulsating on the tides. Later, he became a Coast Guardsman. His Higgins boat was squat and flat bottomed. It pitched and wallowed in the waves. Off Normandy, he came alongside the troop ship looming gray in the early morning light. 
His engine idled. 35 green troopers clambered down the hemp nets and found their places. His boat and others circled and waited. Then with a bone in its teeth, his sluggish ship chugged off to shore. Ramps splashed down. Men tried to storm ashore. Some made it, most did not. He backed his boat off the gravel shore and wallowed back to pick up another platoon. Again and again, all day long, his plywood bows now pushed aside the floatsam and jetsam, the bodies and blood of the dead. Salt-soaked medics flung the wounded into his boat. Blood ran in the scuppers, blood clung to his boots. At the end of his day, he slept. No more summer dreams of life on the Cape. Mm. Nice. Mm. We're getting some awful good poems tonight. Mm -hmm. We've got some awful good judges and a wonderful audience. Wonderful audience, except you're a little quiet. <laughs> I don't mind your being quiet when somebody's saying their poem, but afterwards and before, let it hang out. Who cares? It's being recorded, so if you do something really bad, we'll let you know. <laughs> Judges on the count of three. One, two, three, let me see them. I've got an 8.5, an 8.8, .8, and a 9.5, 8 carrying the 110, a 26-point, hold on, point eight, and Mark moves into the lead with a 26.8. <laughs> <laughs> We got one more in the first round, and then, of course, it's cumulative scoring. So the second and final round, those scores will be added to the original scores. And so it's anybody's game. Let's see what happens. Please, pound your paws for Steven. How to be a rogue poet. First of all, forget convention, the restrictions of form. Don't think about syllables and lines or poetry with rhymes. And don't worry about length. Oh, for God's sake, don't worry about too short or too long and miss the breathless rush of words by writing poems for places that fit lines into spaces on pages with line breaks and margins when you should be writing stream of consciousness prose sentences that go on and on with Mustang Sally going up the down staircase with run around Sue because every poem needs a good run on sentence. They give it a little outlaw flavor. So saddle up cowboy, put on your spurs and start breaking the rules. Let the mind go free like a runaway horse or a jungle cat, like a wild child playing with fire, like the hot desert wind or a storm at sea. Let the mind spout like a Roman fountain and rage like a flood stage river. Let it laugh like a serial killer or tinkle like silver water in a mountain stream. Let the mind flow, searching and seeking, roaring and pouring, filling and forming, rushing and gushing until it breaks down the dam and takes out the bridge and the waters find a new level. Think what happens to lemons to make lemonade. What happens to eggs to make omelets? What happens to animals to make sausage? Or maybe don't think about that. Think about love and life with ethereal light and music and song. Think about loose cannons and death and wars that went wrong. Short wars, the six day war. Long wars, the hundred year war. Wars with pretty names, the war of roses. The great war to end all wars, but didn't. Hot wars and cold wars and what to name the next one that's coming. We're losing the war on drugs and the war on poverty and we'll never stop making war on the environment. But the war of words, which we're having now, is all you need if you wanna be a poet. So just do it because being a poet is a pretty good gig. 
you can wear pajamas all day, talking non sequiturs, <laughs> wear in the space and claim to be thinking, forget to take out the trash. And you can leave pieces and pages of rhymes and metrical lines lying around unfinished because you're a poet. And poets get away with it. Poets have a ticket to ride. Get on the humanity train and head for happy or sad or true love forever or broken hearts and lonely despair. Saddle up that horse with no name and take a ride on the wild side. And who knows, maybe something you write will turn on a light or strike a spark in the dark of a long, lonely night. But whatever you write won't get you into heaven. But if you can make it end, you'll have something to send to all those poetry contests that come along. Or if all else fails, you can see if it scans for poetry slams and then read it on nights like this. Woo! <laughs> Judges, on the count of three, one, two, three, let me see them. Oh. I have an 8.6, a 9.6, and a 9.5, carry the one, a 27.7. Oh. However, this breaks my heart. He was 11 seconds over the three minute time limit. Oh. <laughs> now often I hear people booing me when that happens. <laughs> I didn't hear anything, that's fortunate. <laughs> With a 10 second grace period, he's only into the first segment of 10 seconds where five tenths of a point will be deducted. So from 27.7, I subtract 0.5. Who can tell me what his score is? 27.2. A 27.2. And my and Stephen moves into the lead. Congratulations, <laughs> Stephen. <laughs> Everybody ready for round two? I hope Stephen is because he is our starter of round two. Please welcome back to the stage. The incredible Stephen. <clears throat> the fingers of God. Mary Shelley designed a creature composed and constructed of parts stolen from a combination of cadavers, a composite of pieces of people, a blend, a mix, a potpourri of attributes and skills and experiences taken from the bodies she mined for use in the creation of Frankenstein. When I was born, they say I had my mother's eyes, although my nose and ears and the big chip on my shoulder came from my father's side. And so it went. My athletic ability came from the way grandpa played ball for a minor league team in a backwater town. My love of animals from the crazy aunt with 27 cats who ate cat food herself and my inquisitive mind from poking my Pinocchio nose into other people's business and reading too many strange books. And so in the end, and up until now, I'm parts and pieces of relatives or people I've known and places I've been. A yard sale pastiche of experiences, a kaleidoscope of color and sound of songs I've heard and dreams I've had, making the harmonics of my life a little off key. So what is one to do to be made whole, to turn discord to melody and lyrics and get all of me working in concert? They say lightning never strikes twice in the same place, but tell that to the charred oak on Golden Ridge, which suffered three strikes in the last seven storms. Tell that to lightning rods on churches and barns that burned down. Tell that to kite flyers and storm chasers who race to stay in the path of electrical storms and see the bolts come down an ionized channel for a good air-to-ground strike. 
Tell that to the Indian tribes who watched the white streaks play in the sky and called them the fingers of God. Mm. Tell that to Mary Shelley, who connected her creation to an electrical charge and got herself a bestseller. Which is why when cumulonimbus clouds tower up to 30,000 feet or more, and the top becomes that black anvil dome of an electrical storm on a hot summer night, I head for the old oak on Belden Ridge and sit there on the charred stump, waiting for the bright flash of light and that whip flash crack of sound when the fingers of God reach down to surround and touch the crown of my head with the synchronizing life force, which will finally set me free and let me become all that I've been waiting to be. Yes. <laughs> Judges on a count of three would two, two and a half, two and three quarters, three. Let me see him. I've got an 8.8, an 8.6, and an 8.7, 13, 21, carry the 2, 7, 8, 6, 14, 7 is 21, yeah, carry the 2, 18, 28, 2, 18 and 8, a 26.1, which gives Stephen a total score of 53.3, and he's way in the lead, Stephen. <laughs> However, Mark has a chance. Please give it up for Mark. <laughs> This is called Korea. In Korea, the Chinese swept across the Yalu River, grinding up American troops. In North Weymouth, a firefight broke out. Wayne, Jackie, Bobby, and a small swarm of others swirled around, guns of all sorts blazing in the woods. Ghost rounds whizzed through the branches. Waves of attackers came online and charged. Streams cut through the air. I got you. I got you. No, I got you. Victory, defeat, and then the sides change. We fight the way puppies grow strong, challenging their peers in rough and tumble, toothless combat. Then we part ways, seeking the day. It's time to poke a wasp nest. We, we run fast away, PF flyers pounding on the pavement in panic as the feared imaginary swarm chases us. There's the girl. Shirt pockets covering bulges of breasts. Wayne stops and talks with her in a low voice about secret stuff. She blushes. I wander away, sensing exclusion from some intimacy. I'm off to the salt bog. The tall marsh haystalks bend as I brush past. White bleached crab shells hollow in death, cling to the grasses with withered claws. Disquieted, I feel a sense of death and life around me. The street lights blink on, I must go home. In Korea, the Chinese sweep across the Yalu River, grinding up American troops. Judges, on a count of three, I'm gonna do this in Spanish. <laughs> So this is going to really test your knowledge of language. <laughs> Uno, dos, tres, déjame. I have an 8.9, an 8.2, and a 9.1. That's a 12, carry the 1, 9, 8, 17, 9, no, 26.2. Which goes to zero, carry the one to the six and the seven and six is three, carry the fifty three point zero for Mark. And he's in second place. We'll see what happens now. Please spank your palms for Hannah.
Okay, this is called La Plaza Blanca. It was an inhospitable kind of beauty. The way the wind had sculpted the sand, the way it had howled and whistled across this desert and across the years. Unnoticed in its shifting, without witness to its movement of grain upon tiny grain, patiently creating until what was left was not at all what had been before. These impossible towers, this white place, these drip castles of time, the mirage of stability, the promise of stone, where there was really only ever dust. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Judges! This time in Spanish and backwards. <laughs> Tres, dos, uno. Dígame. A little slow, Andy. <laughs> he's always been a little bit speedy, but today he's a little bit slow. And an 8.1, an 8.7, and an 8.8, .8, and 7 to 16, 1 to 17, a 25.7, giving her a total score of 50.8 for Hannah. <laughs> Wait no longer. It's time again for JD, who will unmute. Am I muted? Okay. Um, can anyone hear me? Because I'm not trying yeah. to see your view. Okay. Um, this poem is called Daff Odils. We bonded over daffodils out there in the field, springing up like a mirage or a spontaneous blind date. He stumbled on them first and lay down among them, shouting, Look at me, I'm a weed, moving his arms and making daffodil angels. I want to be a weed too, I said, and lay down next to him, my shorter arms making smaller angels in the reds and blues and yellows beneath me. Those colors suit you, he said, and kissed me on the nose. All my colors suit you, I said, and kissed him on the mouth. Let's be weeds together, he said, and our angel-making arms locked. He kicked his legs into the dirt, and I went into the dirt, too. We were a mad contagion, infesting the field daily, until our parents came looking for us and found us while we were sprouting upward. They dragged us from the field, clutching our discarded clothes in one hand and our frightened hands in the other. We'll talk about this when we get home, he said. <laughs> but we never did. We never talked. We just rotted in our rooms as the daffodils took over the field again and our angels disappeared. One day, though, in late December, I heard a tapping at my window. The daffodils are all dead, he said. I know, I said, I know. Hand in hand, we escaped back to our now frozen, flowerless field. It's, it's still beautiful, he said, releasing me and waiting for my response. We only went there that one last time, but that was more than enough for our weedy hands to move it from mirage into something we could keep all these years since then that wonderful, lingering, bittersweet smell. Yeah, yeah, you all right. <laughs> Judges, on the count of three, I'm gonna make it simple. I'm gonna go high, one, two, three, like that. And then I'll say, show me. Are you ready, judges? One, two, three, show me. I have a 9.5, a 9.4, and 
Oh, an 8.65. Carry the one, a 27.5, which gives JD a total score of 52.5. Such a quiet audience, so polite. And this next slammer deserves the politeness. But before she starts, unmute yourselves and let her hear how welcome she is. Give it up for Lee. Nightmare. My first dream, no, nightmare. As far as I knew, I stood on planet Earth. I was like the brother I never knew, four, his age when he drowned. I thought I was awake, the emptiness was real. The landscape, as far as I could see, dry, pockmarked, grayish brown, nothing growing, nothing at all almost as if I were on the moon. I needed a grown-up. The dryness, the emptiness, the hot wind pushing me, they scared me. But the bullhorn was worse. Everyone over the age of four is to be blown away. No one else can stay. I could not see anyone else. I had no one to hold my hand, to keep me from blowing away. None of our woolly sheep grazed by. Maybe that dust cloud over where the earth curved away hid one of our horses galloping, hooves beating the earth. Or maybe Tonto and the Lone Ranger. No, just stinging clouds of sand. Who would take care of me? Help me find food, water, a place to stay where I would not blow away. I never told anyone until now, never told anyone else why I wear these heavy boots which weigh me down and look for friends with strong hands. Mm. Yeah, that's so nice, yes. Uh, yeah. Ooh. Judges on the count of three. One, two, three. Let me see them. I got an 8.2, an 8.7, another 8.7, 7, 14, 16, 9, 8, 17, 8. Is 25.6, a 49.6 final score for Lee. <laughs> Our last slammer of the evening, barring a tie, please put your hands together for Lisa. Here is a poem I wrote. 20 years ago, believe it or not. Montpelier, home of the brave. What happened to the next American revolution? I'd rather die for my poetry than die for my country. Does God bless America and no one else? America the beautiful, your government has furrowed you too soon. You who resisted the system till it split and sold you, mined and oared you, farmed you down and built you up, dulled your luster and headed elsewhere to abuse the same beauty. This empire will leave no vestiges behind, no Parthenons to Socratic thought, only searing scars punctured by silent culture. I will not stand for the violence that dictators sanctify, Soul absence is no way to walk city streets when nightless days burn so bright from, turn, from trading oil to fuel power. I remember to breathe. 
I am reminding myself to breathe. Does God bless America and no one else? I've got my five cents and I'm standing at the crossroads, ready to pay the toll for resolution. If I do one thing every day, it will get better. The climate is right for poetry. I bow, ear to the ground. I hear the rumble of revolution, the talk of this town, raising a toast to dissent between residents in the hillside and state officials in their suits and ties, me disguised as myself, clothed in the guise of Vermont bliss, walking this town with its tourists and ghosts in empty storefront windows. It is my wish that everyone listen that everything be heard. So I ask, what happened to the last American Revolution? What occurred when citizens like Patrick Henry said, give me liberty or give me death? I'd rather die for my poetry than die for my country because to me, these words incite liberty more than our democracy ever could. America, did God shed his grace on you to seek freedom of speech through media monopoly? to ensure homeland security with preemptive threats? If so, arm all who object with a rapier rap to challenge your act. I'm taking bets on sure success if we each cast our vote against the illusion of certainty and become what it means to be free. Nice. nice. All right. Judges, on the count of three, uno, dos, tres, dijome, a 9.1, an 8.0, and a 9.0, now they have 26.124, a 50.0 for Lisa. <laughs> Folks, we've come to the end of a beautiful evening. I guess we have. <laughs> it's frozen? <laughs> yep. Oh, Jeff. Doing that on oh, purpose. Oh, Jeff. <laughs> he doesn't know how to do it on purpose. <laughs> maybe no one should... it's on purpose. Maybe That's very should... dramatic. Maybe I should call... I'm going to call him. Does Sabine get to read again? Oh, good idea. Let's hear another poem from hmm. Sabine when I called Jeff. Good idea. Go for okay. it, Sabine. I'm going to mute myself. <laughs> oh, yeah, he's out. No, oh, he's, he's back. Oh, he's back. But where, where is he? I, I definitely need to. You're muted. Jeff, you're muted. Jeff, you're muted. The unmuted <laughs> Jeff. <laughs> what an improvement that was. <laughs> Anyway, I want to hear from Michelle and for our three judges, please. There's one more poet to read. And now to announce. What? Wait the, a minute. Wait, we're going to have Jeff. Sabine. Going to hear again. Sabine. What was the comment? Are we going to hear Sabine? I want to go. Oh, yes. Let's hear yeah. Sabine. In your absence, Jeff, we decided to hear another poem from Sabine. That sounds great to Doesn't me. Doesn't that sound good? All right, yes, Sabine, indeed. bring it on. Okay, this poem is called Longing. Looking outside, I see summer's landscape of verdant fields, mountains, wildflowers, lichen, ferns, evergreens, and the shimmering moon. I remember the southern ocean, the warmth on my toes, sand, surf, shell. Thinking of this causes the mist that has always been but wandered to be heavy. I go and rest in these mossy fields and inside I glow because now I understand, because now I know this is where I'm supposed to be. Oh, nice oh. <laughs> oh my God. Great job, Sabine. Mm. Oh, you're the next Amanda Gorman. <laughs> I'm the next Amanda Gorman. I know you know who that is. That's very, very nice from our local champion.
-hmm. That's great. I hope on April 9th, Sabine will return with Lisa and Hannah, <laughs> and all three of them will actually enter the true competitive fray. Two of them were there tonight. Sabine was there to clean up, to start and to finish. Thank you so much, Sabine, for making this a special evening. And now our runner up with a 53.0, please recognize Mark. And for our winner, with a 53.3, I have a prize. <laughs> a prize for Stephen. Stephen, will you accept the prize? Is the check in the mail? <laughs> it's a prize you can receive only by Zoom. Oh, dear. It's a little piece of music that I am going to perform for you. For me? Well, I love it. Yeah. Oh, oh. Sure. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen, and congratulations. Thank you. And what a wonderful audience. Please come back, those of you who did not slam tonight and those who did, come back and slam. See whether you can outscore the incredible Sabine or tonight's winner, Stephen. And thank you again, Kellogg Hubbard Library and Poen City Montpelier. Thanks, Michelle, for making it possible. Thank you, Jeff. Are you going to send out announcements uh, on email about the next one? On email? It's on definitely on the website, on the Kellogg Hubbard Library website on the Poem City page. This program is out in the community now, has all the readings that we'll have this month for Poem City. Jeff has been part of Poem City for the entire 12 years that it's been going on it's our 12th year and jeff ran a slam on that first poem city thank you jeff i can't wow. imagine poem city without you yeah <laughs> poem city vermont i can find everything yeah the kellogg hubbard library website kellogghubbard.org and there's a poem city page what, what? kellogghubbard.org oh kellogg hubbard okay yeah the library I suggest we give it up for our slam master, Jeff. Yeah. No relation, you it. Yeah. Jeff. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Mm. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. Great job, slam master.